And we welcome you back here on the Fighting Saints Report. Jack Molesky joined by Jim Leitner. And after breaking down the path so far through these playoffs for the Fighting Saints, we'll look at the rest of the series. And in the first round, the other Eastern Conference series, Cedar Rapids, the four seed against Team USA, the five seed, but it's not the juggernaut Team USA that we're used to. It's the U-17s and, you know, heavy advantage CR going into that series. They're the four seed, but they also had a chance to be the two seed up until the last day of the season. And Team USA, the U-17s, backed into the playoffs. They played the last five games. They didn't win a single game. And CR flexed their muscles on home ice. I mean, absolutely obliterated them. I don't think in my mind that was ever going to be a series, but it was even more lopsided than I originally thought it would be. I would agree with that. I I thought uh, Cedar Rapids had such a good stretch run. I think next to Youngstown, I think they were one of the better teams in the Eastern Conference down the stretch. And, you know, a team that I think I think that they could represent the Eastern Conference in the Clark Cup Finals if they, if they get a few bounces here. And uh, but that was a, a relatively quick series, and mm -hmm. I, I think that went pretty much as as scripted. Yep. Uh, that's Dubuque. I mean, excuse me, Cedar Rapids was, uh, I think, the better team, the more physical team, the team that was probably more suited for playoff-style hockey. Mm -hmm. And uh, Team USA was the younger of the two, and it kind of fizzled down the stretch, as you mentioned. And uh, I think that pretty much went as scripted and <laughs> I didn't other than Jason Poland seeing how many goals he could score uh, I, I think that was uh, pretty much what you expected out of that series at Western Conference you had Fargo who was the five seed the defending Clark Cup champion Fargo Force taking on the Des Moines Buccaneers <clears throat> at Buccaneer Arena the four seed and then the other series three six Sioux Falls at home against Sioux City Fargo didn't take long for them to be unable to defend their Clark Cup championship. They made more moves this season than anyone else trying to figure out something to get that team going, and they just <clears throat> never could. And, you know, Des Moines was a team that looked to be maybe the top team in the West at the beginning of the season, really fizzled during the middle portion, started to play some good hockey again towards the end, and they dominated them in Game 1, a 7-3 victory, and put them away pretty convincingly in Game 2 as well. I thought the Buccaneers, they, they had an edge in that series in my mind to begin with, but I don't know if I saw them being quite as dominant as they were against Fargo in just two games. I, I didn't think so either. I thought that was a series that would go three games, and you know, you know Fargo was a team that had, I think they had 10 players who were acquired from other USHL franchises throughout the year. Yep. And that's <clears throat> that's an awful lot. And I, I kept waiting for them to find their chemistry. And, you know, was, I think we talked about that back as early as November, that as soon as that team found its chemistry, it was going to be a team that would really contend in the Western Conference. And by the looks of it, I don't know if they ever did. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they ever found that chemistry. And, you know, they were tinkering all the way up to the trade deadline and, you know, to bring in 10, 10 new guys, I mean, that's basically half, almost half your roster. Uh, it's tough to find that chemistry, and, and they didn't. And I, I was surprised. I really thought that would be a much better series. I thought it would go three games, and I actually kind of thought Fargo would be a team that would pull the upset. Well, not really an upset, but be the, the, four, or the five seed beating the four seed, and it just... Uh, just didn't happen. Yeah, that series, I think, you know, you look at the other Western Conference series, Sioux Falls, Sioux City, if anything, it felt like that series would be the more lopsided one, and we found our USHL game of the year in that series, no doubt about it. Yeah, that was actually a three-game series. <laughs> right, in two That was games. a three-game series, and uh, Sioux Falls won it two to nothing. Yeah. Now, how, do you, how do you do that? Yeah, that was by far, uh, it was interesting, I, I watched that triple overtime game or quad, quad, yeah. quad we, were we were texting back and yeah, forth and it's, I, you know never it was, gonna end it, i didn't think it was and i was really hoping that it would get the ushl record the overall yeah. record for tier one record for the longest tier one game record. it was the only quad overtime game in tier one history uh the previous record was actually held partly by sioux city yeah. they played in the other game uh and they were up against the river city lancers now the omaha lancers <laughs> But Sioux City had 70 shots in the first triple overtime game against the River City Lancers. Not nearly that many shots. And, I mean, that game is 
that's playoff hockey at its yeah. finest there. It's low scoring. You go into the fourth overtime tied at 1-1. Yeah. I mean, that's that's playoff hockey where you, you it's mind-boggling when you see these 8-7, 6-5 games in the regular season and you think, how did they just go 120 minutes with yeah. two goals combined? Well, I, you know, I look at it, uh, it's, it's understandable in the NHL to have a game go three overtimes, four overtimes, because <clears throat> those guys out there are at the top of their game. Mm-hmm. They don't make a ton of mistakes. But, you know, when you, you go down to lower levels and, you know, get to the USHL, you know, these guys are, are teenagers. A lot of times those overtime games are decided by a mistake, you know, a, a costly turnover or, you know, something that just goes wrong and it's it's a bad mistake and that's how it, those games end. So you really don't see overtime games go more than, well, they usually don't even last one full overtime. Uh, so to see that, it, it really did remind me of an NHL-style playoff game where both teams, you know, maybe the first five minutes of each overtime, they really went for it. But the last 15 minutes of each overtime period, they really buckled down and played good defense and didn't make mistakes. And uh, that is that is playoff hockey at its best. And, you know, it's it's a game that it was – I just tuned in just for the heck of it. Right. And then I was it was kind of addicting. You couldn't really <laughs> – you really couldn't turn it away. And you, it was – kind of getting a little yeah. upset during the intermissions in overtime because I'm like come on get back on the air and uh, but it was uh, it was a lot of fun to watch that and uh, you know something that will definitely be in the uh, USHL time capsule for many years to come it's pretty impressive the thing that I was most <clears throat> impressed about in that game is you know and you mentioned this is younger players I mean <clears throat> some NHLers are as young as some of these guys but by and large this is a younger less mature group than you'd get in the NHL so to keep the level of focus that they had oh, to, yeah. to have through that game especially the goaltenders especially Ben Cross there were a couple chances I mean Sioux Falls was probably the better overtime team throughout the amount of overtimes yeah. that they played but you know there were there were large stretches where just defensively how many times the puck was laying in or near the blue paint and you see a defensive player just calmly swatted out there. I mean, there was not a lot of panic, and you're exactly right. When I was looking through overtime games, a couple playoffs in recent memory where there wasn't a single double overtime game, yeah. uh, you don't see many pass. There were only two triple overtime games, I believe, uh, before that one in the Tier 1 era, and that's a 17-year span. So it's it's remarkable what they did. and It's a tough way for Sioux City to end their se- season, no doubt about it. Sioux Falls moves on. So you have Muskegon up 2-0 over Dubuque right now. In the Western Conference, it was Tri-City against Des Moines, and as dominant as Des Moines was against Fargo, Tri-City has been as dominant as anyone all year, and they're proving it once again in the playoffs. They went 8-3 game one with a hat trick from Brendan Furry, who I think it's no doubt he's the best acquisition this season of any team. They grabbed him from Omaha about a third of the season through, and he's been over a point-per-game player for Tri-City since. Then they win 2 nothing because they have the best goaltender in the league as well, and Isaiah Seville. And the best defense. It just best could be the best everything this season yeah, for Tri-City. for sure. So they're up 2 nothing. The other Western Conference series... Sioux Falls decided four overtimes wasn't enough. They almost went to a double overtime in game one against Waterloo. 20 seconds left before they scored the overtime winner 3-2. But I think then you saw fatigue finally set in in game two and Waterloo all over them, 6 nothing. So you have Tri-City, who I can't imagine we see Des Moines coming back in that series. But Sioux Falls and Waterloo, even though Sioux Falls has to be tired, that really feels like a series that could go the distance. I, I agree. And, and, you know, it's... Uh with Sioux, when you have an overtime situation like that where you've, you've played four overtimes just a couple of days early, you know, fatigue is going to set in. But a lot of times what's, what's kind of amazing about that is it usually that first game of the next series, you have a lot of energy. It's always that second game when you don't have it. And, you know, I was, it was amazing to watch that, you know, them, them win the first game in that series in Waterloo. You know, not only you're, you're talking about a quick turnaround, you're talking about going over and playing in Waterloo on that giant ice where you have to skate a lot more, expend a lot more energy, and uh, to win that game in over, overtime was really remarkable. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Sioux Falls won that series. You know, the, the thing is with, with Sioux Falls, it's a little bit different than what 
Dubuque face because their travel isn't quite as bad. Mm -hmm. You know, in the first round against Sioux City, they were at home. Uh, so they had home ice for that, so they could rest and recuperate a lot easier. And going to from Sioux Falls to Waterloo is probably only a four-hour trip. That's not as bad as, you know, going to Youngstown and then coming home and then going to Muskegon and coming home. So I think fatigue will probably be a little bit less of an issue for for Sioux Falls in this series. So I, I do think that that's a series that could go the distance and, Although right now, Sioux, Sioux Falls holds serve and wins twice at home. They, they advance. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, winning one on the road. A uh, series doesn't officially start. I think the saying is the series doesn't start until the road team wins a game. Well, the series started game one then in Waterloo because Sioux exactly. Falls took it. And then you look at the other series, not with Dubuque in it, and that's in the Eastern Conference, Cedar Rapids and Chicago. Chicago flexing their offensive muscles in game one with a 6-3 victory, and the USHL's leading scorer, Nick Abruzzese, went from no points in the playoffs to tied for the playoff lead in points in one game. He had a five-point night with two goals and three apples, so a fantastic offensive performance. Then a little bit more defense in game two, still a 4-3 victory, but this time Aiden McDonough with two goals, including the overtime game winner for Cedar Rapids, and there, that series again, now officially started. Cedar Rapids takes back home ice advantage, and I think both of us feel the same way about the, the teams where Cedar Rapids certainly seems to be the team that's built more for playoff hockey, and I like their advantage in that series a little bit. Chicago's offense can, like you saw, put up six goals, and that's a difference maker sometimes, but the big key for me is Cedar Rapids has a chance to close this series out at home, and they finish the regular season 11 0 and 1 on home ice. I mean, they're phenomenal at the stable, and I think that's the biggest key in that series. I see Cedar Rapids winning it, and I wouldn't be shocked if they win the next two here because of the home ice advantage now. I wouldn't either, but, you know, I'll tell you what, I remember going back to October or September and, and thinking that Chicago was a team that wouldn't make any noise this year. And, and they have. I mean, that's a team that at the beginning of the year I, I didn't think would even make the playoffs. Uh, but it's a remarkable testament to, their, to the work that they've put in and how much everyone has improved in that team. Uh, so I, I do like Cedar Rapids. I think Cedar Rapids is the better team in terms of playoff style. But I, I guess it'd be stupid of me to not think that Chicago's got a really good chance because... I think they've proved a lot of people wrong all year that uh, they have enough firepower to do it, and they defend enough to to keep the puck out of the net and set up their puck possession and, and score. So I mean, it's uh, like I, like you said, I I do think Cedar Rapids is better suited for this style, but I don't know. I just I I can't I can't put Chicago out of it just yet. You know, it's. Just, too good of a team. Chicago and Cedar Rapids tied 1-1. Tri-City up 2-0 over Des Moines. Sioux Falls and Waterloo at 1-1. And Dubuque down 0-2 to the Muskegon Lumberjacks. It's where we sit right now in the USHL playoffs. We'll take another break when we come back. Today, not much publicized about it until recently, but the 2019 dispersal draft officially over with Central Illinois letting the league know earlier this season that they would not continue operations into next season. All those players and affiliates eligible to return to the USHL were kind of partied off into different USHL teams with the dispersal draft, and we'll go through the Fighting Saints picks and see who they got out of this draft from the Central Illinois Flying Aces. That and more on the other side of this break. Stay tuned, Super Hits 106. How do you 